run down to a neighboring property to get on internet for this. And so, uh, you know, I, my hat and everything is over there. If I, if I'd, a hat, if I'd, a, if I'd, a known, I would have grabbed it, but you know, you guys leave me hanging. All right. I think you, left, I I can make you feel not left out. Here we go. There you go. That's my man. Can someone verify? I think I actually added, pulled added. off. I think we, it says video is private. So now I just need to make it public. I think we're streaming YouTube. I can go check if you want. What channel? Is it on your noggle? Yeah, my my main one. Yep. So is live. WTF happened. Live stream weekly update. So it looks like we are streaming YouTube. Just need a confirmation because this is like the second time I've done this. But it does look like we are effectively <laughs> streaming YouTube right now. Yep. Sure. Yep. Yes, you are. Nice. All right. Well, let's roll this thing. Holy well, I crap. I figured something out with technology. You're like a tech savant. <clears throat> Well, guys, luckily the company does not um, have to run off of Chris and I with technology because we are both horrible. I think, Chris, you might be worse than me, which is saying oh, a lot. By uh, far, dude. Try, try not to take, you're not going to take that crown that easy from me. I promise you, I'm going to fight you on that one. <laughs> the funny right, thing is, too, I'm this. a millennial. You'd think I'm good at technology, <laughs> but I'm an old millennial. So, oh my goodness. All right, let's get this sucker going. Three, two, one. What's going on, everybody? It's another week, another wealth webinar, and here we are. And you know, it's interesting. When I do webinars like this, where I bring a bunch of our friends in to talk about the secret, the thing that we've all learned that has changed our lives, our families' lives, and our future generational like family lines that we don't even know about yet, it's always interesting when you bring a bunch of your friends in the industry that others, the outsiders, the 95 percenters call competition. I've done this before and I've had other people be like, why would you bring Caleb and Chris onto the show? They're competition. Aren't they going to take your business? Here's the thing that people need to understand is what we are all doing. Like This is like the pioneers. We are literally pioneering and creating things in this space, the space that was brought to the world by the late R. Nelson Nash in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And what we are all doing is coming together collaboratively, collaboratively if I can say that right, to create things that the world has not yet seen, create financial freedom, create control of your money, and create a world for our futures, but for also we're givers, so we want to share that with all of you and for your family so you can create whatever that dream is, whatever that worthy idea that's planted in your mind is. And then all you need to do, folks, is share it and give. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. So what I want to do is bring the whole panel up, and we're going to go around and have everybody explain who they are, what they do, and why they're even on here if they know. Let's start right at the, up at the top. Kel, what's happening, buddy? Man, it's it's a it's a pleasure to be on here. Um, I I'm yeah grateful to be speaking to a a group group of 130 plus and counting on Zoom. It's unbelievable the energy that is coming in virtually, and I'm I'm pumped to have great conversations. So I run BetterWealth.com. We do lots of things, including uh, infinite banking and overfunded life insurance. We have a YouTube channel called Better Wealth and a YouTube channel called And Asset, and we've been creating content. I know that. Pretty much every single person on this call creates content. And I think I sent a screenshot to both of the Chris's and just said, hey, there's people in the comments that want us to do something together. And so it's it's fun that we're making this happen. Love it, man. Absolutely love it. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're coming together to just create a, a reality, a future that I don't even think we know what it is. So let's move over to the man in the tropics. Mr. Chris K, take it away. What's up, man? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm stoked to be here, um, Caleb. I remember when Caleb sent that message, and I was like, "And anytime uh, I have the ability to get on and have a conversation about this stuff with with everybody, I'm a, a total nerd for it. I, I love it, and uh, you know, I run Life 180, uh, the YouTube channel. Life180.com is our site. We're we're running an agency, an IMO, um, but I also run the Cashflow Hacking Fund, which is the new uh, private equity fund focused on real estate investing. And that's what 
I'm doing down here in the Dominican Republic. We just bought a uh, hotel and are finalizing uh, stage one of our our first round of cap raise for that. It closes in about 10 days. And so I'm kind of working around the clock right now, working on renovations of the hotel, getting that up to speed. Um, got our first retreat coming in on January 26th, which is going to be kind of crazy. And so it's all it's all going going nuts. But I love it. I you know I love I love uh, the power of whole life insurance. Um, you know I I think it uh i i wouldn't be where i am right now if i if it weren't for uh leveraging what we have and what we do when it comes to life insurance and so it's it's uh, you know the 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 fund that we run like was only made possible because of this you know and and so it's 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 actually it's pretty fun so i you know i i love i love uh getting into the nitty gritty and the details and um you know i i guess i've kind of built a reputation of calling people out online and, and, you know, backing it up and especially in the IUL space. And, uh, I love, I love being the one to kind of lead that charge and, you know, and, and so, uh, and I think it's important, you know, like, and people, you know, going to your abundance mindset, right? Like people ask me the same thing. It's like, you know, when I put the interview that I did with you and Devin, our, one of our interviews that we did together, um, I spliced up and did a bunch of stuff with, and I've got some of those videos coming out. Actually, one of them's coming out later today. And, Everybody asked me like, why, why are you guys doing that too? And it's like, listen, the, the world right now, what we do is so important. And I believe that at my core. And unfortunately, there are literally, literally hundreds of thousands of IUL agents misrepresenting and miscategorizing, characterizing life insurance as an asset. And so we need to, the people that do it the right way, the people that are utilizing the right products and the people, you know, even, even if we don't all see exactly eye to eye and exactly the same way, the fact that we're using the same product with the same overall philosophies and the same stuff, like I, I always tell people, you know, if you, if you, the good thing about whole life, if you do it right, is that time solves all problems, right? Like with an IUL time makes all problems worse, you know? And so um, like that, that to me is, is, I think it's, it's just, we need more people creating content. We need more people, uh, collaborating in the whole life space because we need to make more noise because unfortunately the IUL people are making more noise than us. And so, um, I think it's all, it's, it, we have a responsibility to collaborate. That's the way I look at it. Well, I think that's definitely going to be a topic we're going to get out is why it seems like the IUL folks are noisier than we are. We are going to get that out. But Chris, I, I couldn't help but noticing looking behind you. And this is something I tend to do on YouTube channels. Is, yeah. you know, I'm, someone's talking, you're always looking behind. What is that behind you? That That's one of those brand new high impact hurricane proof windows, right? Yeah, something like that. No, this is just a, I'm up on, like I said, my internet uh, crashed at the hotel. And so I had to go over to my buddy uh, who's actually my developer. I came over to his house and he's got like this rooftop terrace. And it's just, uh, it's just like a wooden stick, you know, wall. And it's like, you know, it's just like super basic and simple. Um, it looks like a jail cell to me, dude. It's, ah, <laughs> no, it's the opposite, man. I'll, I'll be jailed here all day long. It doesn't bother me at all. So, oh, man, I thought that was one of those Art Deco impact resistant hurricane. Yeah, something like, like that. No. Down in those parts. You know what it is? It's one of those things where if a hurricane comes, it costs about $30 to fix it. A couple sticks and some glue, man. Love it. Exactly. You need to use duct tape. And that's what we're going to talk about is how IULs are duct taped together on some levels. But exactly. let's let's move on and let's go over to my partner in crime, Mr. Snaggy, coming in from Florida. What's happening down there, man? I love it, man. The first three minutes, we're already going hard in the paint on the IUL crowd. So get ready for some fireworks today. You guys know we're here every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern for Wealth Webinar and looking really forward to today. They always say your net worth is your, your network. And if you look at this network of this little group right here on this Zoom and everybody we have over in the chat box watching, I mean, that's what it's all about is, is doing this together and, and doing it uh, the, the right way. And that's what life's all about. So I'm just happy to be here and uh, contribute whatever I can with you guys. So Rock and roll today. I love it. And the latecomer to the show, Mr. Burr, Mr. Devin Burr. And holy crap, what an interesting you know, like segue as we kind of have you know, Mr. Chris Kirkpatrick, uh, Life 180 on here talking about IULs, where Mr. Devin saw one of my videos that was on uh, Steve Trang's podcast, right? Uh, I think it was right before the pandemic. And uh, he was talking with a well-known IUL specialist and and he was also talking to me and I'm starting a policy with Devin 
And then he's got the IUL guy in his ear and the IUL guy tells him that I'm a scam artist, that what I'm telling him about whole life isn't how whole life works, that everything I'm saying is a lie and none of it works. So Devin calls me back up and he says, hey, I think I'm going to change up that policy. We're not going to do the big one. I'm just going to do this really small, you know, $6,000 a year policy on my daughter. And I'm like, Okay, man. Yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever I can do to serve you, not knowing anything about an IUL guy. So Devin, I don't mean to drop that load on your lap, but uh, uh, take it from there. Well, um, as you dropped the load on my lap, I think the baby just dropped one as well. So, <laughs> Like this baby has a superpower for pooping. Um, so I might have to leave a little early to change a diaper. But yeah, guys, so crazy to think that the pandemic, so March of 2020, um, almost four years ago, seems like yesterday, I learned about this concept of infinite banking, heard Chris on the podcast, and I was like, this is absolutely insane if it's real. So I started going down the rabbit hole like most of you have, and I was I was literally obsessed with it. I was up at 2, 3 in the morning researching it on my phone. My wife's like, what are you doing? Why aren't you sleeping? I'm like, I'm changing our lives. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to change our lives forever. And yeah, I ended up getting kind of suckered into IULs. I had two of them. And um, I ended up getting the policy with Chris. It was 6000 bucks. I wanted to see if it was real because the IUL agent said that it wasn't. I'd put this money in and I'd, I wouldn't see it for 10 years. So I'm like, all right, I'll put 6000 in. I was able to use 5,000 within like three or four days. So I'm like, okay, this guy, Chris, isn't a scam artist. Let me do two bigger policies. Started using them for all my, my real estate deals and just really started multiplying money using them. And then the IULs, I had those for three years. I was putting 18 grand a year into them between two policies, one on me, one on my wife. Three years in, I had a whopping $4,000 in cash value. So who was the scam artist? <laughs> you know what I mean? Once I gave my money to the IUL agent, I could never get him back on the phone. And then I ended up actually um, uh, surrendering those policies. So I, I lost a, a bunch of money really, but lesson learned. And then I took that 18 grand and put it into policies that we wrote whole life. And I've already been able to use that money and deploy it and this little one already has a policy, uh, $10,000 a year. My daughter has three policies. I have three. My wife has three. I've got one on my mom, one on my dad. I live and breathe this stuff. And it's crazy to think I only learned it four years ago. So the possibilities of infinite banking are infinite. That's why it's called that. And if as long as you understand just banking in general, banking is literally just making a spread on money. That's all it is on borrowed money. The banks, they use our money to do that. So all we have to do is use the insurance company's money and use our money as collateral. And we can just go become our own bank. And once you understand that, it's super, super simple. So excited to pour into you guys as long as I can with this one and help out as much as I can. And this is just, oh, okay. Tell them all about it. <laughs> so. Uh, excited to be on the panel though, guys. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, I, I kind of was thinking as we had this rock star panel of, you know, like what direction we'd go, I was hoping that our audience of 151 would help drive us. So audience, every one of you, the first thing I'd like to know is how many of you are on this webinar for the very first time today, put I in the chat. Let's see who our newcomers are. And also, uh, you know, as the newcomers come in from Nicole to Jen, Jackson, Leah, uh, Verona, Mike, they're coming in hot and heavy now. Scott, Doug, I can't keep up. But so we always have a bunch of new folks to come. And I, I don't always want to go too fast because the folks that are just coming in, they're, they're kind of like, OK, what is this all about? You know, I heard this was about money and taking back control of my money and doing what the wealthy do with their money. So. I think one of the, the places I'd like to start is I'd really like to just start with what it is that we actually do. Now, a lot of people, when I look at the chat, you know, as soon as Chris was talking IULs, you know, we got Larry coming in. Thanks for joining us, Larry, asking about IULs. Wait a second. This isn't IULs. Then what is the vehicle? And I said, it's a specially designed and engineered whole life. And, and then he says, what companies? I'm going to 
pause real quick. We will hit the companies that we use and why we use them and all the ins and the outs. But I think the one thing that we've got to always go back to, and this is the hardest thing, I think, from a mindset perspective for every single person that, that comes into this circle that starts learning about what it is we're going to talk about is we actually are not specifically talking about a product. Now, everybody's like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You just said it was a specially designed whole life, not an IUL. That's a product. Like, what are we talking about? What we're actually talking about is a process, a process that's been around for, gosh, hundreds of years, if not longer, called banking. You all know banking. You've all used banking. This is nothing new for any of you on this webinar today. When you get a paycheck, what do you do? You take your paycheck, you put it into a traditional bank. When you need that money to pay your bills, what do you do? You swipe a debit card, you write a check, you go take a withdrawal. When you need money for that new car, that new boat, that new house, what do you do? You go back and you beg and plead and you, you try to get a loan from that bank or this bank or that bank. And that's the process that we've been taught. Every single thing I just said there involves you doing one thing that you never, ever should do. And that is giving up control of your money to someone else. Because when you put money in a bank, the bank is in control of your money. That's why to get your money back out in the form of a loan, you got to actually, you got to do it through, go through an application, pull your pants down, show them, you know, what's behind the curtain. You got to go through all sorts of things. But also then you've been taught to put money in 401ks. I was on the, a call the other day with some two really high powered, way overpriced CPAs. And we're talking about tax strategy, estate planning, and all this stuff. And she made a mention. She says, well, one of the things our clients do is they put money in a qualified retirement plan. I said, ma'am, I'm going to stop you right now. The two folks you're talking to right here, we're not putting money into a 401k to get a tax deduction today to pay taxes on it later. She's like, holy crap. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe no one else ever sees that. They're just trying to chase the egg and chase the, the tail of their taxes today. And then they end up paying a lot more later. And I said, yeah, not only that, they gave up control of their money to everybody else. So specifically, you have been lied to folks your entire life about how money really works. You have literally been taught to do things with your money that the wealthiest families throughout history more than likely have not done, but have told you to do. So I think uncovering this whole beginning of what we're going to talk about, which is, was pioneered by the late R. Nelson Nash, as I mentioned, and it's called the infinite banking concepts. So I want to go around the panel and I want them to give their interpretation of the infinite banking concepts, what it is, what it's done to change their life and why everybody needs to learn this. So let's just kind of, we'll use the same process. Caleb, you want to take that one from the start? Yeah. And I, I, I believe I came on your podcast and you asked me the same question. So those of you that want to go back and, and see how inconsistent my answer is, I would I would love to lo love to hear that. But uh, when I think of infinite banking, I think of a process of of saving your money and using it as efficiently as possible. And I really highlight the word efficiency because my definition for efficiency is removing any friction to get to where you truly want to go. And it should maximize future. It should maximize control. Those are two things that I care a lot about. Um, and so when I think of infinite banking, what I do and what a lot of our clients do is they, your money's got to be stored somewhere to be able to use throughout your life, whether it's a checking account, savings account, CD, regardless, your money's got to go somewhere before it's deployed. What I believe we all do on this call is, is utilize an overfunded whole life insurance policy as the place to store and save our money long-term. And the beauty is you can save your money long term and you can also utilize it throughout your life. And I believe it's the most efficient way. Remember, efficiency is maximizing control, compounding. It's removing the most amount of friction to get to where you want to go. And so, um, in other words, we utilize whole life insurance to save, grow our money and use throughout our life. And that is the function of what some people call um, infinite banking. I wrote the book called The And Asset because when set up and used properly, it's one of the greatest ands. I think instead of having or, do this or that, we should say do this and that. And the beautiful thing about what we're all teaching is I think we're creating more ands for people. So that's my my non-scripted. I'm sure uh, I have a million different answers uh, depending on who asks, how the questions ask, but that's kind of how I explain infinite banking in a nutshell. Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, and it's pretty interesting. Like I mentioned earlier for everybody that's joining here, you know, we we kind of did for the second time, we streamed to YouTube. So 
I had no idea how many questions that was going to bring in. So one thing I'd like to do a little housekeeping just because we got a lot of traffic. If you have questions, folks, please put them in the Q&A, which is usually below. Mine's a little over here. And then they'll get answered. If you put them in the chat, there's about a 99.99% chance it's going to just fly by and we're going to miss it. So we don't want to miss any of your questions. Please put all questions that are relevant into the Q&A and we will, we will try to address each of them. And my team on the back end will also you know, be pounding out emails to them. So sorry, Chris, let's come over to you. Infinite banking concepts. What yeah, is man. it? How has it changed your life? No, so it's it's awesome. I mean, I'm here in the DR because of it. Um, but but I'm glad Caleb went first. I knew he was going to go there. Um, and uh, it, it gives me the ability to kind of expound on it a little bit. And so um, I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. Uh, it's about removing friction. And one of the things that I always tell people is that money is more emotional than it is mathematical. And uh, it's 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 challenging. Math math is an important component to it. But I always kind of tell people like people make decisions emotionally and then they validate those decisions with logic. And I think one of the challenges that, you know, agents in this business have is we all kind of had that moment where we made this emotional connection to why why this is important to us and then to validate our own decisions. And this is this is a real issue in, in the business and because what happens is agents clients, whatever you, you have this moment. And Nelson Nash always says, this isn't something you learn. It's kind of something you catch, right? Like, and it's something you just like, oh, all of a sudden it just like, wow, it clicks and it makes sense. And so that's the emotional kind of connection on the impact that it makes in your life. And, um, I think that emotional connection is so important. And, you know, what happens is people then try to validate that emotional decision with logic. And then, in that process, now then they go on and they get licensed and they want to sell it. And then they, what happens is people start to try to sell it logically. They try to sell it on illustrations. They try to sell it on all these things. And that's what kind of creates a lot of misrepresentations about, you know, what this is all about and, and the power of whole life insurance. Um, what I would say to that is my this is the, how I break it down is I, I believe that if we if money is more emotional than it is anything else and and i believe in the power of the subconscious mind and i've done so much work around that personally in the last year and so like this last year has been really uh it that this this has been a huge foundational component of my life is what i would call aligning your money with your values and beliefs and um when i when i think when we reverse engineer what we want our money to do for us in our lives and when we reverse engineer what our values and our beliefs really are, what our goals and objectives are. It's not that whole life insurance has to be the product, you know, because the infinite banking concept is a process, but I think the product winds up being a natural, the consequence of the product winds up being whole life insurance based on the attributes that it brings to the table and based on um, the, the the abilities that it allows, you know, your money to perform that those multiple functions. And, um, you know, I, I just... I think my favorite thing about what we do, whether you call it the and asset, infinite banking, I call it cash flow hacking. Like, you know, it, it, it's it's really, I think it's a process, it's a human process that's gonna force you to become who you need to be to live the life that you wanna live. And I think the, the important part about money is that the financial system is designed and set up to tell you that you're too stupid uh, and not capable to be able to control your own money, not, you know, you're not competent and capable enough to be able to do this. So you need to hire a financial advisor, you need to put money in a 401k, you need to give up control of the results in your financial life. And there's no other area in your life that is important to you that you do that. You know, I, I talk about faith, family, fitness, finances, and freedom. Those are the things we all want to get the freedom. And ultimately, it's all about cash flow planning you know, as Caleb and I have talked a lot about over the years in a lot of videos. And it's, um, it's, it's just one of those things where when, when you, when you utilize a properly designed whole life insurance policy and you align your money with your values and beliefs, and you're intentional about how you're handling your money and how you want to use money as a tool to create cash flow through other investments, whole life insurance is not going to get you rich. It's the backstop to protect and secure your wealth. And it's also going to be an accelerant because it's going to allow you, it allows you to implement a process that helps you grow to become who you need to be, to live the life that you want to live and to be able to open up opportunities for other investments, i.e. the Dominican Republic for me and all these different things, whatever it looks like to you. Um, but I think that's it. You know, I, I know there's all the the classic answers, but like to me, it's the process of of personal growth through having control and reducing that friction. And it's just giving you a vehicle to become who you can be.
because oh, man. that was know. good. That was really good. I love it. And one of the things too, you know, that I think all of you heard there is whole life is not the silver bullet. The whole life policy is not going to make you wealthy. And I, I don't mean to kind of sour for anybody. Anyone's like, wait a second. I thought that was the golden goose. It was the, the yeah. whole life product. that was going to make me rich. All that uninterrupted compounding interest, tax-free protected, like, oh, mm-hmm. folks, it's the process. The machine, the whole life policy is just used to run the money through it. And and there's so many reasons why. I've, and I think one of the best, and all of you should really, really take the time to get Caleb's book, The And Asset, because it eloquently explains exactly that. The And Asset, right in the name of his book, you have the whole life and the other asset class that you're going to buy into. You make money twice. That's the whole idea. It's so many people, and, and I know this whole panel, and Stephen, I didn't mean to take anything from you, and I know Devin's changing poopy diapers, but like when you think about this, this machine, the whole life, which has been around forever, it's just literally a machine. It's a machine we use instead of a bank account, a 401k, a brokerage account. That's that's what it is. And it's the same machine the wealthiest families have used. But we don't leave the money sitting in the policy all the time. Now, I know Caleb has different you know take on this, but he also, in his book, talks about the end asset. So it's not the whole life or S&P 500 or a whole life or real estate. It's the whole life and real estate, the whole life and the S&P 500, the whole life in any investment you want. It's two assets in one package. You don't have to pick one or the other. And too many people are like, oh, I make more money in, in my stocks than I do in whole life. Why would I ever put money in that? Because you don't understand what we teach. Stephen, infinite banking concept. Yeah, man. I mean, I, you know, when I first met you in 2019 and we started traveling around doing some of the different seminars, you know, I really came from the the real estate investing seminar world where, you know, it's all sales. It's all very like kind of, you know, like raw, raw and build it up. And there's a lot of, you know, I just, I saw so many people out there that are like these gurus that aren't actual professionals, aren't actually great at what they they teach, you know, that they more talk the talk than actually walk the walk. And so when I first started listening to you and Brent talk about infinite banking, I, I honestly just thought it was a gimmicky thing. Like I was like, ah, oh, this is just something that people are, they're using to kind of get people in. And, you know, it's not really all that great. You know, I came from Wall Street also. I was a financial advisor for a couple of years with Ameriprise Financial out of college. So that was kind of my mindset. And then, um, you know, we, we built the company and then uh, the seminar company and the COVID hit and shut it all down. So it's like, all right, well, now that I have time, I'm sitting at the house, let me actually dig into, you know, what are they talking about with this mapping out the millionaire mystery book? And, you know, what is this book that Chris is talking about, the and asset? And what are these, you know, uh, becoming your own banker by R. Nelson Nash? And who is R. R. Nelson Nash? So I finally had the time to start digging into it and reading and studying. And and it just started like, wait a minute, that's not, pop. wait a minute, how does that, that can't work that way. And it was really mind opening to me. I was like, holy cow, because I, you know, I got to the, I was kind of, I was kind of at a point where I was like, I kind of know everything about this stuff. And I realized I didn't know anything about this stuff. And it really opened my mind. So, you know, by a, a stroke of, um, you know, disaster there with COVID hitting, it kind of led me on the journey. And, you know, a lot of people think that I've been doing infinite banking for a lot longer than I have. I mean, it's brand new. I started my my first policy in 2020. I have four policies now, but, um, you know, and I keep growing my banking system, but it's only been a short, short three going on four years now. It hasn't been that long. And it's not only everything that you guys were saying it was and wrote about and talked about, it's that and so much more. I mean, I learned new stuff about the infinite banking concept every single day. And this is all we do full time is talk about this. So that enough to tell you, but here's the cool thing with IBC, with banking, with controlling your wealth is you don't have to do it all at once. You know, you could go down the list of people on here right now with Tess and Todd and Anna and and Terry. And, you know, they've been following for a long time. And every single one of them would tell you the exact same thing. They took it slowly. They started with, they chose one thing to implement. And then they went on to the next and then the next. And then all of a sudden you have one policy, two policy, three policy. All of a sudden now you have a self-directed retirement account. So all of a sudden now you're investing in private funds and you're buying hotels and you're doing all this stuff that two, three years ago, four years ago, you were like, that's for rich people. That's for the wealthy. Like I have no business doing that in my life. And all of a sudden you realize, Hey, this is for everybody. Like there's no reason I shouldn't be doing this. You're doing it for your family. You're sharing with your family. And it's just, it's such a really cool thing. So just a little quick, uh, 
story there about my situation. Awesome. And we'll finish up with Mr. Burr. What is the infinite banking concept and what has it done for you besides put a bunch of Porsches in your garage? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to blame Chris on that one. Uh, I got a Porsche. I got a Porsche and now I'm in love with them. So I bought a 911 and I had an Audi SUV as like my everyday vehicle. We had the baby. It was a little too small. So I'm selling it and I bought a Porsche Cayenne as my um, everyday vehicle. So thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate you. Um, but infinite banking really is, it's like I said before, the concept of just becoming the own, the bank in your own life. Everyone uses money. Everyone's money flows somewhere. So it's just a way to flow your money and to, like Caleb said, in the most efficient way possible. Where can it go that gives you the most benefits? In a policy, it's protected against lawsuits and judgments in most states. Um, it's with institutions that don't go under. They're not insolvent. The companies we use have been in business for 100 plus years and profitable every single year through really any economy, through World War I, World War II, the Civil War. These companies are profitable. So you're instead of flowing money through a bank that's insolvent all the time, because they lend out more than they have, you're putting it into a place that only lends what's in their general funds. They're never insolvent. They're always profitable. You're putting your money into a place that gives your family a future death benefit with the one thing in life that's guaranteed, death. You're guaranteed to die. So the fact that everyone out there does not have a life insurance policy blows my mind. You have to have insurance on your car. You have to have insurance on your house. There's no guarantee you're going to crash your car. There's no guarantee your house is going to burn down. You are guaranteed to pass away. You just don't know when it is. The insurance company doesn't know when it is. You hope it's way in the future. The insurance company hopes it's way in the future because then they can take the funds that you're putting in as premiums, manage them for longer to go make more money to pay out the death claim. So the longer you live, the less um, the less risk the insurance company has. So you're with a mutually owned company, which is the companies we use, you're literally in partnership because when you put money in a policy, you're a part owner of that business. You're in partnership with a company, again, profitable every single year for over a hundred years, never insolvent, pays out a death claim to your loved ones when you pass away. And by the way, also, you can use all those funds throughout your life to become your own bank. I bought my 911 with my policy. I'm buying my Cayenne with my policy. I bought my daughter's car. She just turned 16, my older daughter. Um, we will get back all the money for all those cars. I do all my real estate investments. So to Caleb's point, it makes anything you do with money more efficient because when you put money into a properly structured whole life policy, not an IUL, it's guaranteed to grow and compound tax-free, guaranteed, regardless of what you do with it. So you put money there, it's going to grow. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Contractually, it's guaranteed. Then you borrow against it and go do whatever you're going to do with the money. Lend it, a real estate deal, a car, whatever, while the money's still compounding and growing over here on a guaranteed tax-free basis, as long as it's set up properly. So it's literally making your money more efficient to Caleb's point. And what it's done for me is it's kind of hard to even explain. I mean, 2020, I was a full-time real estate investor. I had a net worth of about 300 grand and I was on pace to make around 200 grand that year. Brand new investor. So I was actually off to a good start. I had left my job October 8th of 2019, and I found out about infinite banking, started using it with all my real estate. I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. By the end of the first year, I had four policies. I'm using them for everything. And I think as human beings, when we learn something new, when we hear something funny, when we find out something that's just that gives us an emotion, we want to share that with other people. So naturally, that's what I was doing with my policies. I was sharing what I was learning, and it was falling on deaf ears with the people around me. So what did I do? I got on social media, started talking about it, 
And I grew a following like that. I had within a couple months, several hundred thousand followers on TikTok and everyone's wanting a policy. So I was sending them to Chris. Chris remembers this. I was sending him business like crazy. Hey, Chris, I got 30 people here, 40 people here, 50 people here. A week goes by and I'm like, this is the dumbest thing ever. I'm just spoon feeding this guy, Chris. How about I become Chris? So I had no inclination to be an agent. For the first almost year, I was just a practitioner. Then I realized, oh, I can help a lot of people because there's a lot of attention on me now. So I started, I became an agent and I started selling policies. And now I'm the third highest at One America behind Brent Kessler, Chris Noggle's mentor, and Chris Noggle, my mentor. So it's insane what it's done for me. It's given me the ability to help more people. It's given me the ability to make sure my family, my daughter, um, she's a month old and she will be extremely wealthy throughout her life. She's going to learn all these concepts of how to use the, the policies. And then I can assign them to her. She can then use them, teach her kids, my grandkids, how to use them. And then when I pass away, my policies will be fed into our trust which then my daughter will take it and buy more policies. So tax-free money goes to policies that grows tax-free. Then when she passes away, it's inevitable. Death benefit will go to the trust. Her kids, my grandkids will buy more policies. So it's insane what it's done for me and like my future um, family tree. And I have this goal, like this vision of, I don't know, 100, 200 years from now, whatever. Someone in my family, they're in like a huge mansion and there's a painting above the fireplace. It's of Grandpa Devin, Grandpa Mr. Burr. And they all know like, hey, what we have is because of him. They never met me, but they know But because of like what I instilled in them, what I instilled in the family, the policies we do, everything that they have, it started with me. So it's been incredible. I, I owe everything to Chris. I appreciate you, brother. and. I just love the fact that we can help a ton of people. And one thing, I, one last thing I want to say, a lot of people, and you touched on this early, Chris, is why would you guys all be together? Your competition. You guys have to understand in America, I think the number is like 300 million people. I can't write 300 million policies, not even close. I've written 1,700 in three years. So Chris can't write that many. None of us can write that many policies. So it doesn't matter how many I write, how many Chris writes, how much Caleb writes, how much Steven writes, there's more than enough people to help. And that's the way you have to look at it is come together, collaborate in order to help more people. And there's always enough for everyone to go around. That's the abundant mindset. That's the way you always have to think about everything. I love that you hit that. And we're going to kick this over to Caleb because he's got his hand up, but I, I want to preface one thing here because that is something that we get but you know the, the the infinite banking concepts is the process of taking back the banking functions in your life which a lot of people make the mistake and in, in things you've heard because we're we're literally we're dripping things here to you and some of you are hearing them I'm getting questions and you know one of the most important things is I want you to think about banking I want you to think about when you take a loan from a bank bank gives you money and what do you do in exchange for that money you make a monthly payment to the bank right that monthly payment always includes principal and interest every single time. And if it's only interest in the beginning, it's principal on the back end, which is usually even worse. So would you ever stop paying a loan to a bank? No. And if you did, bad things happen. Your credit gets hit. You lose the asset. They, they foreclose or take your car or whatever it is. The same is true when you all are going to become your own bank. I, I want to preface, and, and I know Caleb and Chris are going to really hit this one home, but if you're going to be the bank, be the bank. Don't start your own banking system, your own policy and steal from your bank. Don't think that all the magic is in the top part where you take the loan from the policy and you're like, oh, it's so good. I put money in this policy and I take a loan and I'm still making interest on the money in the policy. That's great. That's a path for failure because you haven't completed the circle. You haven't finished your banking process. You stole from your bank right there. You took a loan and you haven't set up the recycle recapture. So one of the most important things I want to plant a seed, a worthy idea in all your heads, is that if you're going to do this, you will still make loan payments. 
on every loan that you ever take from your private banking. If you take a loan <clears throat> from your policy to buy a Porsche as, as Devin did, you will make a car payment back to the policy with one big difference. Because some of you are like, wait, that sounds crappy. I saved that money. Why would I pay? Why would I have to pay money that I already saved? It makes no sense. It makes all the sense. What if every payment that you made on everything that you own, every payment you make every single month on every debt you have, what if that payment ended up back in your bank and you could use it the next day? Every payment. What would your life, life look like? Add it up. Do the math. How much money would you have every single month if you made a monthly payment for your car payments, your mortgage payment, your loan payments, your credit card payments? They all were the exact same payments you make today, except for one change. The bank that you put them into, the bank that you pay them to, has your name on it. And every payment you make, that money's in your bank every day. What would your life look like, Caleb? Yeah, man, I I, I love just how all, all of you guys articulate this. When I think of what we're talking about, the biggest criticism that infinite banking will get is people will compare it to an investment. I just did a video on my YouTube channel reacting to the Money Guys show, and they're just like, they just had a whole show trashing infinite banking and it's just like i i could have told you exactly the talking points before watching the video because i've seen i've seen them all i've seen all the videos of people like trying to expose infinite banking and it's all about talking about the investment and i think sometimes you know playing devil's advocate i think sometimes i understand where they're getting because a lot of people when we talk about infinite banking we talk about how we use it and you know even Devin, like infinite banking has allowed you to purchase so many things which is awesome but really, when I think of infinite banking, I just think of it as a foundation. A foundation is not sexy. A foundation is something that you don't even see. But whatever you build on top is only going to be as great as the foundation below. And so a lot of times what, what gets me frustrated is people try to compare the building to the foundation, but they're trying to compare apples to apples. They're trying to say, you know, wh whereas what we're trying to do is we're, we're creating the foundation and then it's only as good as how you use it, what you build on top of it. But if you have a small foundation, you can't, it, it's hard to shoot for the moon if you're, if you're not, if you're not really doubling down on that foundation. So I think the, the thing that I just want to emphasize is everything that you guys said is valid. However you use your policy, what I think of infinite banking, I think of building a solid foundation for your family. Devin, I get emotional, but you thinking about grandpa grandpa Devin and the generations because but that's exactly what you're doing it's not just building businesses and investing it's thinking generationally and and that's something that I think is just really really important and everything consistency compounds and so if you can consistently build that foundation you're gonna five 10 15 20 years from now you're gonna you're gonna be like how in the world do I do I have all these things working in my favor it's because today, five years ago, 10 years ago, you decided to be consistent and build that foundation. And there's no better place to build a foundation now and in the future for your family and for all the unknowns in the world than an overfunded whole life insurance policy. It's not an investment. How you use it is going to really determine the how many Porsches you can have in your garage and all those things. Like the the, the value creation needs to come in and, and life insurance, a lot of people think it's just going to solve all your problems. It's not but it's going to build the foundation for you to build something amazing on top of it. So I don't know if that sparks any thoughts or questions, but just, just continue as you guys were think, talking. I'm like, man, I want to make sure that this is articulated for this amazing webinar and on YouTube because that, that's the biggest thing that I see getting mixed up when it comes to life insurance, infinite banking, even the people that talk about IULs and all this stuff, a lot of times they're talking about it as a sexy building not the foundation. And unfortunately, they give us all a bad name on TikTok and other platforms because you almost like, you're like, I cringe when I see a lot of people pitching life insurance. And unfortunately, it gives us all a bad name because they, well, I, I won't say what I really think, but they, they, they're, they give us all a bad name. All right. So here's what we're going to do because that was a great segue. We're going to literally get the animal out. I wore the animal shirt today just so you all could see it. So we got the animal. We're going to let the animal out. We're just going to kind of go crazy. It's no more of this like going through a, you know, one after the other. Everybody's just going to go at will when they want. And there's going to be interruptions. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be a party like it's, well, I used to say party like it's 1999, but then it's party like it's 
2021 when they opened things. Anyway, let's get on with this. So here's the thing, folks. I want to preface one thing on what Caleb said. When you look at the wealthiest families, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Walt Disney's, the Ray Crocs, and, and so many of the other names, what do you think? You think legacy, right? You know that those families have been around for multiple generations. And every generation, that family has gotten wealthier, owned more assets, built bigger things, gave more money for good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, we do have uh, you know the World Economic Forum going on, but we won't even go there. But for the most part, a lot of good has been done in each generation. Each family member has had more wealth. So you really have to question that. And it's very quite, it's quite simple. What we are talking about when we're talking about the infinite banking concept, private banking, you know, all these other names, BYOB, all these things, we're talking about starting with a foundation called whole life insurance. Now it is specially designed and engineered to give more cash value. And that's what Caleb was talking about. Everybody wants to talk about the investment, the cash value, but mark my words and remember this for the rest of your life. The real reason, after you get over the, the buzz and the, the excitement of the high early cash value, the real reason you will do this is because someday we will all be gone. Someday mm -hmm. we will be home, whatever home is to you, heaven, wherever you are. We will no longer be here, but our families will. And our families will live a better life because of what we learned today, what we implemented today, and what we did today. However we do it, I don't care if it's Porsches or stocks or whatever you use this for, your family will be better off. And I want to kind of, I was almost getting teared up with, with Devin just because, you know, we're both new dads. I want you to think about this. Imagine that all you do, folks, is you change one thing, and that's where your money goes first. Everything else in your life remains the same. You still make payments on all the cars you buy, but you make them back to your, you know all this, but, but here's what happens. Someday you die, but your kids, I'll use Vivi, Vivi's kids, every single birthday that they have for the rest of their life, they get a check. And then they have kids and their kids get a check every single birthday. But who's the check made out to or from? Grandpa. Grandpa Chris, Grandpa Caleb, Grandpa Chris, Grandpa Stephen, Grandpa Devin. Every generation for as far into the future as you can possibly imagine receives a check from a grandpa that that child never knew but only heard about because that grandfather changed one thing. That future generation, as far as that, that bloodline goes, will remember that grandpa because of that one change. Folks, that is what we're talking about. The legacy that never ends, the legacy that will change every person's life. Yes, it's the cash value that starts it, but it's the death benefit that finishes it. And that is what life insurance is. It is a check the day you graduate that goes on to make someone's life better. I know this because I've been doing this 20 years. I have delivered more death benefits, and I can't say this for sure, but probably collaboratively more than everybody on this panel, just because I'm old. And I can tell you that when... I deliver a death benefit. When I hand a check to a family member who just lost a loved one, I then fully understand what it is I do and why I do it. It's not the cash value, the Porsches, the houses, getting all the money back, the compounding interest. That is the moment you realize what you do. You won't understand that at this point, folks, but I just need to plant that seed. Open, open panel, whoever wants to talk, just go. Chris, a couple of things to add. One, you're not old, you're experienced. Yes. Okay. Well said, Devin. Round of points. What is your what is your uh your biological age? Wait, 20 or 44? 46. 46. So still in the grand scheme of things, extremely young because I'm a firm believer with technology, with AI. As long as AI doesn't kill us, we're all living to be like 150. Devin, I fully plan I will outlive my endowment age on my life insurance contracts of 121. It's going to happen. Mark my words. This is being recorded. You heard it here. One thing I want to add to what Caleb said. So, so true is infinite banking did not. It didn't make me buy the Porsche. It didn't. It didn't give me the ability to do that. My ability to earn money was how I could buy the Porsche. Running that money through the policy just made buying the Porsche more efficient. It made it to where I can get the money back for the Porsche instead of losing it forever. So I get that a lot as people are like, oh, yeah, infinite banking is going to make me really rich and wealthy. No, it's going to make everything you do. Again, always going back to the efficiency. I had Caleb on my, on my podcast and we talked a lot about efficiency and I started looking at it through that lens. 
it will not make you rich or wealthy. It'll just have your money be more efficient. So Nelson Nash says you should have two businesses. One, the business where you make money. And two, the business of banking, how that money flows. So your business for making money might be you're a school teacher. It might be that you're uh, a private money lender. It might be that you're a real estate investor. You're a firefighter, a policeman, whatever it is. You make money and then you flow it into policies and then you, you have a business of banking, how that money flows. And to Chris's point, if you take policy loans and you just put them out there and never recapture the money, your policy is going to probably implode unless I would say, unless you're way down the road on your policy and it's so efficient that it doesn't really even matter that much anymore. But early on first couple of years, you can't just take policy loans and never repay them unless you take the policy loan and it's making you far more than what it costs you to control that money. So easy, easy numbers. If you take a policy loan for a hundred grand, and it costs you 5%, super easy math, that's gonna cost you 5,000 bucks to control that money for one year. If that 100 grand, if you can lend it for let's say 15%, you're making 15 and it's only costing you five. So you just take five grand of the 15 grand it made you, pay the interest, you keep 10 grand. The whole time your 100 grand is compounding in the policy. So there's so many different ways to look at it, but one thing I just always want people to to really keep in mind, infinite banking is not something that's going to make you rich and wealthy. It'll help you become more rich and wealthy, but you always have to have somewhere where you're making money. And then infinite banking is how you flow that money. So hope that, hopefully that yep. makes sense. I, lo I love it, love it, love it. It's an amplifier. It's And you articulated it better than I did. It's like you have what you have because you're creating massive value. And whole life insurance, infinite banking, the and asset, cash flow hacking, whatever you want to call it, is making it more efficient. It's giving you more efficiency that's going to help your daughter's kids. That doesn't give you goosebumps. I don't know what will. And it's the foundation for you to continue to build and create value. So way to go, Devin. Chris, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I just stayed muted for a second. I got a motorcycle driving by me. Um, so the, um, you know, one of the things that just keeps coming into my mind on this conversation is I think all of us, every single one of us, when we first got into this business, it was all about the cash value. And it was all about like compounding and this and that and like all, all the sexy clickbaity kind of like things that are, you know, true and and sometimes oversold, you know, um, by different people online. Um, one of the things that came up for me last week in a call uh, and, and something that's come up for me this year a lot is just the power of and the importance of, of what we do and, and having a properly designed whole life insurance policy of having a financial strategy and structure that's going to like literally be able to help you execute a long term plan. Because I think that's one of the biggest problems in this world is people don't think long enough term. And if they did, then this would make sense. You know, one of the one of the things it's it's not just the cash value. I mean, I, I, I share the story a lot. My father-in-law and in, in November 4th, 2024 or 2020 was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And, you know, if not for the living benefits and able to access it tax-free, you know, they gave him 90 days to live. And because we were able to accelerate the death benefit and have access to all that, we were able to you know, have multiple six figures of alternative treatment. He's still alive today you know, playing golf four days a week, you know, when he was diagnosed completely terminal with pancreatic cancer. I mean, like that's the death, um, you know, and then I was talking to somebody the other day on, on like a sales call and it came up, you know, they were like, should I get this? Should I not get this? Or like whatever. And my, my advice is always like, listen, I don't know that an infinite banking policy is always the right thing for people right out of the gate. I think at some point in time, it's always, I mean, I think utilizing a properly designed whole life insurance policy is wise, but sometimes people need to need to, clean up their financial house first. They need to get a convertible term policy, right? And the reason somebody kind of pushed back at me the other day and they're like, I don't know if I need a convertible term policy. And just to be totally vulnerable right now, like I remember back when I first started Life 180 in 2014 and um, we were going through the process. I'd gotten a policy on myself. We were looking at getting a policy on my wife and we just decided to kind of hold off and not do it yet on her because of cash flow, right? Because like we were 
just going out of money. I was reinvesting in the business. There was all these things going on. I was involved in a lawsuit with uh, the IUL company that I left and that was bleeding me dry and like all these things that were happening. Um, and then we got into a car accident and we got rear-ended and she got a traumatic brain injury and um, she was no longer insurable. So to this day, we've tried several times. Hannah is not insurable. And had we just gotten a convertible term policy that would have locked her insurability in for 15 years, if we chose like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. And so, you know, it's, thank God, you know, we're in the, in the, in the position we are where we don't need her to work. We don't need like all these things. Like we, we we're really blessed and she's able to kind of do things, you know, the way that we've been able to align our life. But, you know, I know when I, when I talk to people that take, their insurability for granted and take their health for granted and take all this stuff. And then, uh, you know, I, I really encourage people to realize like, listen, if cash flow is an issue right now, just just clean up your, your financial house, like get rid of toxic debt, do all these things. But for God's sake, just lock in a convertible term policy to lock in your insurability, protect your human life value, you know, like, make sure your family's protected because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. You know, it's, it's the, the life insurance part of it is going to, is going to be the backstop to your wealth. You're going to have to go create money, all this different stuff, create wealth and, 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 and increase, you know, add more value to the world. All, all the things that Devin and, and Caleb and Chris just said, and Steven said, you know, but, but I think it's, it's extremely important to know that, that the life insurance side of this thing is, is absolutely vital. And, um, and the only other thing I'd say that, you know, I've been thinking as you guys have been talking is when I think, and th this is where I'm going to, I'm going to stoke the flame a little bit. I don't know if this is going to come off or, you know, you guys are going to agree with me or not. I, I know Caleb agrees with me because I've, I've talked to him at, at, at ad nauseum about this topic, but you know, when it, when it comes to um, taking over the banking function of your life. One of the challenges that I've always had, and I'd really be curious to hear your guys' feedback because Devin, uh, Steven, uh, Chris, we've never talked about this personally, right? So I, I, I want to hear your guys' feedback on this because my perspective is taking over the banking function of your life simply means control, right? And so when I think about control of my money, I think about the fact that I'm saving money into a policy and it's going to grow and we have all the benefits that we all know and we're going to probably talk more about and that's great but when we talk about leveraging a policy loan and we talk about leveraging capital like let's just the fact that we have the money in the policy is the asset whether we need to use the policy loan or whether we use a bank loan or a cash value line of credit or something else there's always a cost of money period whether you use a policy loan whether you use a bank loan whether you and and listen there's there's uh good and bad of both options. You know, there are situations where using a policy loan makes more sense because of the flexibility it provides, so on and so forth. There's situations where using a bank loan makes more sense because at the end of the day, if you use your policy loan, you are giving up control of that money, whether you like to, you like, and, and, and we talk about control. If I have a hundred thousand dollars in, in a policy, well, the asset is that hundred thousand dollars and the ability and the flexibility to utilize it. Now, if I can go get a policy loan and I know I can get a guaranteed policy loan at 5%, that's amazing, right? And that's a great thing to be able to know that I can move fast, right? I can close on houses fast. I can, you know, make a, a, a real estate deal, close on a business fast, like all these different things that gives me a, a competitive advantage to other people. But on the flip side of that, if I could go to a, a bank, maybe the, there's structured terms of the loan, but if I can get two and a half percent or 3%, which at this point in time, you know, rates are a little different and so on and so forth. But if I can get that, you know, and what that's doing is I'm using other people's money, but I still have the policy there. If I have the liquidity, let's say I can't make a monthly payment. I could borrow to make a simple monthly payment, right? So I'm still keeping control and I'm keeping my cost of money down. The money's still compounding in my account. You know what I mean? And if more opportunity comes, I'm more liquid because I still have access to that capital and I haven't given up control of that money. And so one of the challenges I hear when I, and I'm not going to name uh, people that I, you know, podcasts that I listen to of people that are like only use the bank or only use the, the whole life insurance policy as your bank. And I, you know, I, I don't know how you guys feel about this. I've never really gotten into it, but I am. Uh, and I know Caleb is as well as like a big proponent of 
not just leaning solely on your whole life policy, but leveraging that as a tool to give you more flexibility and pure, more purely more control. I, I got to take this one, Chris, because like Go for it. I, I use a traditional bank. And it's called a cash value line of credit. Now, I don't talk about it much anymore because as rates went up, so did the interest rates on my cash value line of credit. But the thing, the way I'm using my banking system is the money's moving so fast, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. you know, I got money going out on loans all the time to various sources through private money club. I got interest coming back. I'm taking all that interest and I'm putting it into one central hub, which is that cash value line of credit, paying it down every month, redeploying. Yep. Now, the reason I don't mention cash value lines of credit much anymore is because when interest rates went north of five, what you can borrow from the insurance company or five and a half or, you know, it's all over the place with the different insurance companies. But when they went north, everybody's like, oh, my God, I don't want this cash value line of credit. I want to get rid of it and I want to bring it back to the policy. Now, I have 11 policies of which nine of my policies are attached or collaterally assigned to this cash value line of credit in which I have one central place, one checkbook and one deposit place. So all this money that comes in from all my banking activity, car payments and everything I do, I send it all to one place. That is a, I hate to say it, a traditional bank, but I control the narrative. And if I don't like the bank tomorrow, I cancel them and the money goes right back to the insurance company like that. I lost no control, but I'm utilizing it for efficiency and for simplicity. And also, I understand how bank rates work. The Fed, not long ago, good, bad, or indifferent, said we are opening the door for three rate decreases in 2024, whether they do or not. But we'll be in a recession and they will drop rates because that's just what they do. And I'll be happy that I'm still in the cash value line of credit because that will move. Now, again, to each their own. But I leverage my cash value. My cash value is the single greatest asset I own because there's not a single person, no bank, no person out there that won't look at cash value life insurance as the ultimate collateralizable asset. Only second or first, depending on who you're talking to, by treasury bonds. But treasury bonds have lots of risks, interest rate risk, they have price risk. Whole life insurance has none of those risks. So I eliminate every risk of a traditional asset class, hence why banks use bully bank owned life insurance, exactly what we do over treasury bonds because they eliminate the risks and it's a better asset that performs better over long periods of time and provides the liquidity they want. I do the same damn thing, right? If you're gonna be the bank, be the bank, mimic the bank, do what the bank does, but also know when to pivot and when to, to you know ebb and flow to use the bank to your advantage because you can't. So that's my take on that. I yeah, think I think that's key because you control it. Your country, like it gives you the control. Even if you use a bank, you can control the, the leverage of it. I think to a certain point, um, it makes sense to do exactly what you said, Chris, like use banks when it makes sense. However, if let's say, Let's say just figuratively, if I had a hundred million dollars in cash value, I'm not using any bank for anything. You know what I mean? But I'm just not there. So eventually I'll be there. But at this point, it does make sense to use banks for stuff. For instance, this house, I've got a mortgage on it. The mortgage is about 600,000 bucks. I could use my cash value to pay the mortgage off and then recapture the interest, my payment is like 2,500 bucks a month. So I could get that 2,500 back in my banking system instead of it going to Rocket Mortgage each month. However, can I make more than $2,500 a month with $600,000? Yes, a lot more. So it doesn't make sense to use it for that. It doesn't make sense to pay off this mortgage. It makes sense to keep paying the bank until I've just got a stupid amount of cash value. And then it's like, all right, what's 600 grand? Pay it off, recapture that that um, that 2,500 bucks. So I agree with you 100%, unless you just have a stupid amount of cash value and you can totally cut banks out. You can start self-insuring yourself on cars, which I've actually started doing, which is super cool. Um, so I no longer get insurance from, right? Let me take that back. I get liability from insurance companies that covers another car if we get in a wreck, but the collision and everything like that's the highest part of a premium on auto insurance. I don't go through State Farm, Liberty Mutual, all those things. I actually, 
I'm the the insurance company on that. So if I ever got in a wreck, I would use my cash value to fix my car. And then I'm only paying like 20, 30 bucks a month for insurance for liability. So um, I agree with you 100%, unless you just have stupid amounts of cash value. So what I'd like to do now, Caleb and Steven, I'd like both of you to hit this topic quick. And then we're going to then go for the juggler, because I know a lot of you have been waiting for this from the second we started till now. And what the what we're going to first do is everybody's going to go through and say one quick mistake they've made that they they would change if they could using the infinite banking concept. And then we're going to we're going to go into other financial advisors, other agents and the all always popular IUL index universal life discussion and IUL versus whole life. So Stephen, uh, yeah. Caleb, uh, take it from yeah, there. I, I'll just, right. I'll quickly jump in on this last subject that we've been talking about. It comes down to control. We have 160 plus people in the zoom. And I, I know there's quite a few people watching on YouTube. Every single one of you will answer this question differently, but what is the value of controlling money in your life? For me, it's a high value. For pretty much everyone on this call, if you if you can create money through business, it's high value. And so whatever that number is, some of you it could be 5%, some of you it could be 50%. We have to be realistic, but what is the value of controlling money? That is your opportunity cost meter. And that's ultimately what should be your, your north and south from a standpoint of whether you should use the policy or use other people's money because we want to maximize the value of our control. So that's that's my two cents. We can make we can do another video in the future that breaks that down more. But that would be like do yourself a favor and figure out what's the value of controlling money. And uh that's gonna be a game changer for you. All right, Steven. Yeah. So you wanted to kind of talk about mistakes? Is that yeah we we can dive right into that. Is there any questions you wanted to hit because I know you've been handling the questions in the QA. Anything that was good that you want to jump out at? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, we can hit a couple real fast. Somebody's just asking, Chris, Kirkpatrick, is it the um, the Mickey's Temptations properties you bought? Or I think you're muted. Oh, gosh. No, no, no. Nothing like that. We we bought a, uh, we actually yeah. bought a, yeah, we're right in construction zone where all these crazy guys are coming in with their bikes and hawking horns and everything, too. So the, um, the we bought a, uh, a, a property that was not even listed through some relationships down here. We got a relationship uh, with a with an amazing developer and a guy who's developed seven hotels down in this area. But we're on the Samana Peninsula uh, in the jungle. Like we're straight in the jungle up here. Like this this place didn't even have electricity till 12 years ago. Um, and it's like the antithesis of, of Punta Cana. We are straight in the jungle, right off the ocean. Uh, comes in, if you look at the Samana Peninsula, um, we're, if you look at it from the airplane, it looks like kind of like an alligator looking up and like taking a bite of something. And right in the base of the alligator's neck is a little place called El Valle. And we, uh, we got it there. If, if anybody wants to check it out, it's unique exotic hotel.com. You can see, see what the resort is. We're renaming it, uh, in two weeks and we're going through a whole process of, of everything right now, but, uh, you can at least see what it looks like and see where it is. It's awesome. Yeah. And so somebody else just asking about the mortgage, like, is it smart to, you know, use the policy to pay on the mortgage, even though the rate's low? And I think Devin answered that pretty well. You know, there's, I there's agree. always, you know, I, I just went through this conversation. My cousin was buying a new Range Rover uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It was a $135,000 car. And he, you know, we discussed like he had the 140 in a policy that I started for him a few years ago. So he had the money in the policy to buy the range, but he's like, should I, use that to buy the Range Rover? Should I finance it through Range Rover as 8.9% rate or, you know, and then take the cash instead? He had an opportunity to put into a real estate deal at 18% annual return. So it's like, should I pay Range Rover the 9%, make the 18% where I'm making the spread and using that to pay for the range? Should I use my policy? And at the end of the day, it actually financially made a little bit more sense to do the 18% investment and use that money to, to fund the Range Rover. But what that didn't take into account was risk. So we have to ask ourselves, even with the real estate deal he was investing in where the risk was very, very low, just because we know who the borrower is and the deal is, so the risk is very low. There's still some risk there and there's a lot going on in the global economy right now. And so that came into play. And then the other question was like, you know, he, he does well, obviously he's buying $130,000 Range Rover, so he does well financially. But what if something does happen financially? He's like, you know, if I if I finance it through Range Rover, I can just let them take it back. 
Like I can just give them back. They can repo the car if they need to. But I said, but wouldn't you rather if you financially something happens where you can keep the car? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, using your policy to buy this, you're in control. So if you don't pay yourself back for a few months, a year, whatever the case might be, nothing happens. Like, so that way you still keep the car until you get back. And, and that's risk-free because you're in control of that loan. So at the end of the day, he ended up deciding to use the policy plus the 8.9% to Range Rover. That's still money that's now leaving your financial life forever. So even though it's not a lot and he could have made it up on the investment side, that's still money that's being bled out. So all those reasons, even though financially it probably made a little more sense to do the investment, he ended up buying the range with the policy. So a lot of these questions like, is this better or is this better? It's not always black and white. It's not always an exact science. There is nuance involved. And that's one of the reasons we're here. Like I know Caleb, your team, Chris, your team, our entire money multiplier team. This is what we do all day, every day is talk with clients, talk through these situations. Like what could this look like? So take advantage of that. I mean, hop on, chat with us, keep asking these questions and just give us some thought. And, and to me, that's the ultimate. It leads back to what all you guys were saying though. You have control and you have options. All right, let's go into one mistake. You would you would love to change if you could go back and do it. You start anyway. Yeah, no Devons, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can start it then. Yeah, mine would be not to do the IULs. Um, again, eighteen thousand bucks for three years is what I put into them. So what's that? Fifty four thousand dollars, and I had four thousand dollars in cash value. So I lost fifty grand. I would, and the thing that really makes me sour about it is I know how policies work now. I didn't know then. And the agent, because of how he structured the policies, made a ton of commission and he was getting renewals every single year that I was continuing to fund those policies. So I just was like, you know what, I'll take the $50,000 loss, make sure he doesn't get paid any more renewals on my policies. So I canceled them. I then wrote the policies for my wife and I. So then I got commission instead of him getting commission. I can use the money instead of him using the commissions or whatever. So if I could go back in time, I would have never done that. I would have instead put that 54000 into properly structured whole life. And I would have been able to take that money. By now, it'd be year four. So I'd most likely be putting in eighteen grand a year and have access to more than eighteen grand at this point. So... I would 100% go back in and redo that. One quick thing I want to add to what Steven said with mortgages and whatnot, and this comes from a guy that I did mortgages from 2005 to 2019. I used to tell people all the time, pay extra on your mortgage, get the mortgage paid down, make an extra payment per year. You'll pay it off in 17 years instead of 30. All of that advice is the worst advice you could ever have. And I was giving it to people. Because think about what the... Think about what the government does. They go into debt by producing a T-bill, right? That is debt for the U.S. government. What do they do with that? They pay that debt back as slowly as they can with devalued dollars. So they're creating more money with a T-bill, putting more money into circulation, which devalues the dollar, and they pay back that debt slowly over time with weaker dollars. That's what you should do with your mortgage. Get the mortgage and pay it off as slowly as you possibly can. Don't pay a penny extra. Pay it off with weaker dollars because if you get a 30-year mortgage, your payments of, let's say, $2,500 on this house, $2,500 now or $2,500 in 15 years, $2,500 in 15 years isn't going to be a lot of money. So pay it off slowly. Instead of paying extra, take that extra money you would have paid to pay down a 3%, a 4%, a 5%, take that extra money and go make more than your interest rate and you're making a spread on money. So just wanted to throw that in there from what I've learned is horrible advice that I used to give people, which is pay extra on your mortgage. Awesome. All right, let's go quick. Caleb, one mistake. One mistake I made in the infinite banking journey is I, when I first got in, I was very, very obsessed with illustrations and compounding and taking loans for income, which those are all valid. But I think what I've learned more is, you know, in my long life is there's th things happen in the future, things are going to change. And 
don't try to sell something based on what potentially could happen based on an illustration 30 years from now and appreciate the foundation, appreciate the, all the other benefits. And I was very focused on one or two like compounding and control, which are still valid. Love them. But I, I've now realized like, man, I've been, I didn't even mention some of the things that are so valid, so important. I mean, the fact life insurance is a reason why Chris's father-in-law is alive. That's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. And like, what's the value of that? Uh, so th those are, those are just some of the things that I've matured and hopefully have improved greatly on, um, since being in business. Steven. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I was, I was thinking about this question. I, you know, I would think probably, um, maybe not starting a policy on my wife at the very beginning because she had some medical issues where we can't get a policy right now. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, it, you know, you think you're doing the right thing waiting or maybe, you know, doing my policy first. And uh, so I probably would have started those, you know, I hear that mostly on phone calls, man, I wish I would have started this sooner. And, you know, it happened to me personally. So I'd probably say that I, I don't, I think I've, I've the policies I've set up and what I've done with them so far, I think has been pretty solid as I've had some of the best advice from, from you guys on how to do everything so far. So that's been, that's been great. All right. And Chris mistake. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I alluded to it a little bit, my wife as well, you know, not, not, uh, I, I think it, not, uh, I guess putting too much focus on the cash value and not more on the lifetime value of the actual contract of the whole life insurance policy. Right. And so it's, uh, realizing that, for me, I remember when I started, it was it was all cash flow and it's all we're all stretched when we're when we're entrepreneurs and when we're getting started in things. And typically people, when they start this, if you're where I was, you're 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 getting going. I had just gotten out of the IUL space and I kind of found the whole life. And I was like, I had this like epiphany where, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, this is exactly what I've been looking for, what I thought I was doing for four and a half years. And so then. I was all in on the the importance of the cash value. And so what I did was I did one policy that was so liquidity focused. And so, because that's what my business was all about, that it it drained so much of my liquidity to be able to do another policy for my wife, another policy to maximize my human life value. And I wasn't thinking about the death benefit. I wasn't thinking about you know my potential future net worth and making sure that I had that locked in. And so- I always tell people the first step, and if I could go back and do it again, when I was 29 years old, when I first got started in this journey, I would have bought, uh, I would have figured out what is the most amount of money a life insurance company will give me for a death benefit. I will maximize that to the T first and foremost by figuring out what's it cost for a term policy. And then based on what I have for a free and available cash flow at that moment in time, I'll complete it with a, with a banking policy. And I'm going to finish this up. Uh, I'm going to quote Mr. Bob Ross. I don't believe there are any mistakes. There are only happy accidents. And I think every mistake I've made in my journey of life, not just IBC, has been the greatest learning lessons, which has allowed me to create what I've created today and allowed me to get where I am today. And I will welcome a lot more happy accidents throughout my life. So let's dive in now to the juggler. And let's uh, let's just do this straight up. Let's just understand this. Don't want to do this. Want to always do it wrong. And why fucking IULs? Here's the swear jar. I'm sorry, you cut up there. I missed you a little bit. Were you talking to me or were you talking to the whole group? Or am I? The whole group. The whole group. Why? Man. Can, uh, can you... Or Chris, can you repeat the question? I didn't catch yeah, it. Please. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's something going on with my computer. I was just saying, so why don't agents talk about this? Why is it that it's not taught by general agencies or all the other financial advisors out there? And why are they all told IULs are the greatest thing out there? Comes down to money. Oh, yeah, that's where the money is. <laughs> like, I don't I don't think everybody is. I, I think uh I don't think all financial advisors uh, like IUL. I, I think um, a lot of financial advisors uh, dislike IUL and whole life uh, equally because they don't know the difference between the two. They don't understand either of them. Uh, and I think that the challenge is this, is that the there's more money in index universal life. Um, the companies that sell 
universal life, the carriers have compensation structures that allow for IMOs like World Financial Group, PHP, PFA, and those organizations to create these compensation structures that pay more. And so therefore they've, I think it's just a function of, of numbers and recruiting and, you know, kind of the network marketing IMO style business that's gotten into this. And now you have literally hundreds of thousands of IUL agents. I call the blind leading the blind, right? Like, because it's, you, you have all these people out there representing something that they don't fully understand. And, um, yeah, so I, I that, that's the problem, you know, it, it's just, a lack of education. It's the business models of the people that are actually bringing agents into the business don't even understand what they're fully doing. And the model incentivizes, there's so many moral hazards built into the models where that it incentivizes, hey, Chris, I'm going to recruit you into the organization as an IUL agent. And by the way, as soon as you join my organization, before you know anything, you got to get a policy for yourself. You got to get me in front of 10 people. And, you know, and you got to just trust me no matter what, right? Like, and, and it's, that's the problem. You know, it, it's literally hundreds of thousands of people that are going through this. And that sounds like a big number, but I'm being really conservative at this point in time. I, I'm just going to go real quick. One of the things that saddens me the most is, I mean, because of our size and what we do, we're, we're talking to literally thousands of people a year and the amount of mm -hmm. IUL horror stories we've come across, good, bad, and indifferent. I what I mean by good, bad, and indifferent is they were sold for different reasons, but I yep. have yet to to today, I have yet to see one, not one, IUL policy illustration perform as it was supposed to. I've not heard one person sit there and be like, this thing has been amazing. It's been the greatest thing since ever I've ever done. It's done exactly what it's supposed to. Not one in the thousands of people, over 8,000 clients that we have, have I seen that. So please tell me how we can have this much steam. That's my, it pisses me off. Bro, I created the IUL challenge. I am nobody's won it yet, have they? Any any agent that can show me a policy that's outperformed or even matched the greatest their illustration that they were sold. So here's the, the premise of the IUL challenge: show me a policy for a product that's sold with upside potential and downside protection. We just got through the greatest bull run in the history of the market. So if you're supposed to take advantage of the upside potential, it shouldn't be very hard for these policies to outperform their illustrations, right? And so. If that's the case, I've said, show me one policy that the current Enforce illustration has outperformed the original illustration sold with the policy, and I'll give you 2,500 bucks. Now, I've had some people tell me that- You should like double that, man. You should just, like me, all of us on here should just pull in a little. We should get that sucker up to five Let's do a group thing. thing. You know, like I, I'm in, like it, it's it's one of those things. There are people who have created videos um of of like hey we've got this policy that's outperformed this but they're 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 full of just like little snapshots and like it's not really the full illustration and that's the thing is like and and color me jaded but uh you know when when doug andrew does a video you know showing oh you know to counter it saying hey we've got a policy that's performed this is just me and i know like maybe you guys don't agree but like i it's not the guy's been in five lawsuits and he's doesn't have his license and all these different things. Like, I don't trust, you know, what's on there. Adobe Acrobat can do wonderful things. That's all I'm going to say. So I don't trust it for anything. That's just where I come from. Caleb, now I know you're, you're like the nice guy of the group. I'm kind of the asshole. <laughs> Chris is kind of the asshole, but can be nice. And then you're like the nice guy that's got the friends in the IUL space. So like, what's your take on other advisors, IULs, and just the, the, pure just shenanigans going on out there in light of all the regulations that are coming out against IULs. Yeah. I, I just think if you, if you follow the money and I, I knew when I first got involved in life insurance, you're only as good as the person mentoring you. And it's, it's just the way it's like, if most people are not educated well, they're not selling life insurance as a foundational asset. And if you're not selling it as a foundational, efficient, safe place, thinking long-term, Life insurance is hard to sell, and IUL is a whole lot easier to sell if you're if you're like I'm serious. Like if you don't know what you don't know, and I was like, hey, I could give I could sell this illustration versus this boring old whole life illustration, and oh by the way, IUL can do all the things that whole life can do, and you get the upside. Like it's they think we're all crazy. They think we're all out of our minds. They think we're like conservative nut jobs that we're like wanting to, you know use whole lifers IUL and it's like, all right, 
if I, if I in right conscience could get paid more, give our clients upside and give them all the benefits of what we're talking about selling IUL, we would all be in line doing it. It's, it just, there's so many unknowns. And unfortunately, I think, you know, there are some people doing IUL, I think, well, I say that with an asterisk, but I think 98% of people are, are overselling it, don't understand what they're selling and they're not necessarily doing it maliciously. They're doing it what what they've been told. And unfortunately, it is truly the blind leading the blind. And it's and and there's just a lot more things that can be disastrous about it. I mean, the fact that Devin, you shared your story, you're you're in year three and you had almost nothing to show for it. That that's horrible. That's horrible. And um, there's a lot of stories out there of people that aren't servicing well. And when the product when the insurance product is the solution, I'm out. I'm out. Like, I just, that's not, that doesn't go to my way of viewing the world. Like, I go back to create value, invest in value creation, create value. And it's like, if you can't tell me how value is actually being created via an activity or an input, I'm out. And unfortunately, the same bad rap that in infinite banking gets for it being an investment, that really is propped up by all the people out there that are pitching, especially IUL as like this sexy investment box. And it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate and it's a shame. So I, I, you know, I try to, I try, I, we all have different views or maybe we all have different styles. I want our channel to be a channel of conversation. I, I want to host different, different insights because I feel like whenever you try to shut down speech, bad things happen. Um, but it's, it, sometimes it's hard to get conversations flowing all, all directions. All, that's all I'll say. So I'm, I'm open for, if anyone wants to break down what you have, your beliefs, your philosophies, our channel's open for you. And we're going to have more conversations with regular, ordinary people. And I don't say that in a demeaning way. I just want to have conversations with all kinds of people this next year. Um, and so it's an invitation for sure for anyone. So I don't know if that's what you wanted, Chris, but yeah, that, those are my great. two cents when it comes to IUL. Audience. Now I know we're going a little bit over. We're 232. You guys want to keep going with this in the chat? Let us know how much you want us to keep going with this and we'll go as long as everybody has time. But you know, there's an interesting thing as you guys are chatting that in me and Chris K, Chris Kirkpatrick, you know, we took a challenge back a while ago. Another advisor asked us if we would come on and talk to a client with that client's advisor, who was a IUL guy, and also supposedly, I think that was a lie, was a CPA. And on this conversation, which went an hour and a half until I literally said, listen, you are taking time away from me and my daughter spending time, and we have got nothing done. You have done nothing but confuse the client. All you've done this entire conversation is talk about a product, a product, a product, a product, a product, not once addressing the client's concern and questions about is which one is better for the process. And I mean, Chris, you remember that. You literally yeah. roasted this guy. This guy is showing illegal non-compliance, like created illustrations. Oh. I, this guy is going to be out of the business. And it blows my mind that that's the kind of stuff that's being done out there. He's lucky that I was taking time and just finishing uh, a week in an ayahuasca retreat in Colombia. And I was just coming off like some Zen. He because, did that. And I was, it was, it was rough, man. Um I just remember like just him lying and me like literally having to be like, dude, that is not how it works. Like, how how are you actually? And I just yeah. call him out on the call. Like, how are you actually saying these things? And the craziest part about that is I remember getting off that call and being like, this is people ask me why I get so fired up about the IUL stuff and and why I do so many videos on it. And you know, it, it's it's because there is so much misrepresentation. I've got a book coming out. It's called IUL Exposed, the truth about the most misrepresented product in financial history. And the reason is because there is so much misrepresentation about what Index Universal Life is. And the problem is I, I bought the, I drank the Kool-Aid. When I first got in this business, I I got in this business, I got into the insurance business initially because I was trying to get a job with my father-in-law as a broker at Wells Fargo. Like that was my objective. Like I went in after the great recession and they said, and his manager said, you can't work here because if I hire you, they're going to fire me. You got to get a job with a life insurance company. I got a job at a life insurance company that focused on IUL. 
and and I fell in love with IUL so so much. I was like, hey, father in law, I'm not going to come work with you because this I found this golden goose. It is this amazing product that blah 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 blah. Did we just lose Chris completely? That was like frozen. Look at that face. Well, at least we got him on a good note there. So let's kind of come over. Stephen, Devin, uh, anything you guys got to want to say about uh, Oh, he's back. There we go. Oh, he's back. back. Oh, so there you go. This is all Starlink. This is the, the bad That was internet. crazy. You were just like gone. Flash Boom. fry. Just vanished. Yeah, no. So I, I don't remember where I was. But like, you know, it. I, I just think I have this unique experience and why I'm so fired up about it is because IUL, I sold I sold four million dollars of premium of IUL before I realized there was a problem, you know, and and I tell you what, having to go back and have those conversations with people after thinking I did it the right way, knowing I did it the right way and still not getting the right result. And a lot of people ask me when I when I went back. And by the way, I had conversations with every single person I ever sold an IUL to every single one of them uh, either. Uh, surrendered their policy or 1035 their policy um, in every single, except for one, one person didn't. It was because he had actually had had cancer. So thank God he uh, at least had the insurance, you know, and, uh, and, and we basically transitioned the funding of that policy to be more like a, uh, like a GUL in, in a sense. Right. So we, we kind of reduce the death benefit a little bit, but we uh, maximize the funding, you know, so it, it, like all that is what it is, but I, I told myself I never want to have to say I'm sorry to a client again because listen, there's no guarantees in what we do. Uh, you can you could still run into plenty of problems with whole life insurance if you mismanage it. But what I can do, you know, at night put my head on my pillow is know that it was never my fault. If somebody screws it up, it can be like I know I'm doing my coaching, you know, and I know that you know they're gonna get all the, have all the resources they need to make the best decisions now. Humans are going to be humans and they're going to make mistakes and, you know, they're going to make emotional decisions and go the wrong direction. But that the thing I love about and I said this earlier in the call, and I think it's, it's, it's super applicable now. IUL, when you design a policy improperly, and let's just say an improperly designed policy means a not max efficient cash value policy. When you design an IUL policy inefficiently, time makes everything work. When you do it with a whole life policy, time makes everything better. It can solve all problems and eventually it will always work out in your favor. That's that's the best part that I think one of the things when people go, why? I think one of the biggest problems online right now with infinite banking and IUL and the reason so many infinite bankers and I fight this fight every day. I know you do, too, is so many IUL people go, oh, I, we have a better way to do infinite banking is because they think it's only about the arbitrage. Right. They think it's all about making this positive spread and being able to borrow at a smaller level and being able to earn more. And that is not the case at all. And so the thing I, I encourage everybody to think about is when you are a policyholder, a client with a participating mutually held whole life insurance company, you are a partner of that company participating in the success of the most stable financial institutions in the history of this world. If you think about it, these life insurance companies have been doing this for 180 plus years now, right? And so when, when you look at like, the transitions, even all these like um, these Bitcoin people and crypto people, which listen, I love I love, you know, Bitcoin, crypto, all that stuff when it's when it's done in the right way and the right structure and the right, you know, circumstance and situation. But a lot of people are worried about losing the world's reserve currency and all this stuff. Life insurance companies have have managed and grown and been stable and secure for for through three different currencies in the US. They were stable in the Civil War. If you think things are going to get worse than the Civil War right now, well, then you should probably come down and visit me here in the Dominican Republic because, you know, it's it's way better and more chill down here, you know. But but like when you are partnering, when you are, have a policy with a policy uh, with with a participating whole life company, you are partnering with them. When you get an IUL, you are a profit center of that company. And the problem is all these IUL companies, all of these IUL agents, I should say are going to sit here and talk about the long-term success of life insurance companies and how Ray Kroc and Walt Disney, all these people did it. IUL didn't even exist back then, right? And 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 when you when you look at the fact that they say, "Oh, these you're you're working with the most stable financial institutions in the world." That's great. You could be working with them, but with an IUL, you are a profit center. Your policy can fail and that insurance company will still forge forward and be wildly successful. With a whole life policy, you cannot fail unless the insurance company fails, period.
Absolutely. Wow, that's that's hard to tackle. Devin, Stephen, anyone want to go after that? That's so good. Devin's baby is asleep. Got her sleep, Chris. <laughs> hey, I have a gift. I'm I have a gift. Oh, I love it. It's like I've heard Chris say this so many times. I'm so like I almost put Caleb to sleep right there. Oh, that was great, man. It's just, uh, you know, folks, sometimes you just gotta, you know, you just gotta seek the truth and the truth sometimes hurts and it's not always right front and center for you. And I think, you know, that's what Chris Kirkpatrick just kind of said is, you know, like he comes from that world. He's the only one of us that was an IUL producer. I was an advisor. I sold VULs and ULs and whole life, but I never was just an IUL producer. He was, but he not only was a producer, he got deep in the weeds and he understood it at a level that like none of us even do. And there's other people out there that Steve and myself, Devin, and I'm sure you two have seen speak where they literally dissect behind the curtains. Stuff would put all of you to sleep, but like dissect IULs and the underlying, you know, the, the puts and calls that they're using, the derivatives they're using to actually make these returns. It is hocus pocus shit. It is a group of Harvard kids they know nothing about the industry, just manipulating numbers and algorithms and all these things, which literally has never been tested, never been proven, and more than likely will epically fail. Let me let me say this. Um, and, and people ask me, Chris, what was it that made you realize the difference? And the uh, the answer is because I, I started as an agent and I became the director of business development, uh, one of the top. Uh, it's actually one, yeah, the top IUL company in the in the country right now, as far as sales volume goes. And um, back then we were number four. But when I when I had a conversation, um, actually it was a conversation that I had with Don Blanton. Um, if you guys know Don from Circle of Wealth, he's he's a, just an amazing guy, and and he was kind of back then pushing me on like, Chris, like you you might want to look at some whole life stuff. And I'm like, Don, why? Like whole life is, you know, it isn't isn't what you think it is like IUL is way better. And he's like, Oh son, like you don't even know. Like if you know, Don, he was just like, Oh son, like you might want to like consider a couple things. And I'm like, Oh, this guy, like, you know, he just doesn't get it. And so I went back, I remember going back, you know, cause I was a director of business development. My job is to go around and coach agents in the company to, to recruit and sell and build their teams and all that stuff. Right. And so I remember going back and he's just, he, he gave me some questions to ask. And, and I actually, lunchroom got to be able to meet with one of the actuaries and the conversation i simply said the first question i asked was like why why like why did this company shift from being a mutual company that focused primarily on whole life insurance and is now selling index universal life and our mission is to become the number one iul company in the country in the business why is that the case like how like because it made no sense to me after my conversation with don and after some research that i've been doing and and he said listen chris and this is 2009, by the way, right? So he goes, Chris, we, we just came out of the Great Recession. We see that interest rates are going to remain low for a long time. And that's going to put a ton of stress on us to meet our guarantees and for the general fund. And so what we're going to do is we're going to shift to index universal life because that takes the risk off of us and it puts it back on the insured. And so like when you and I'm like, isn't that the opposite of everything we're selling? like from a philosophy perspective. And he's like, well, I, I can't talk about your sales process. All I could tell you is how the product functions, you know, and, and why the company is doing it from a general fund perspective. And, you know, that, that answer to me, as soon as I had that realization, I was like, holy shit, I'm out. I'm out. I can't do this. And I walked away from a lot of money. I walked away from a lot of opportunity uh, and you know, had to, and like I said, then got into a lawsuit for non-compete, non-disclosure, all these different things about the things that I learned there. And I gave up my license in 2016, uh, for six years, uh, because I had to keep my mouth shut basically, uh, about everything that I learned. If I had my license, a lot of people don't realize I created the life 180 YouTube channel. I, I asked Caleb when we first met, it was literally like right when, after I gave up my license and the reason I gave up my license because I couldn't keep making YouTube videos and talk about IUL. I had the choice to keep my license and and sell and keep my mouth shut or give up my license and create videos and educate people about IUL. And that's what I chose to do. Wow. It's a hard thing, man, but you did it. And sometimes that path, you know, leads to really great places like it does here. 
And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything, but I think what we'll wrap up on is Jimmy's question. Jimmy came in and said, uh, are the IBC policies or the specially designed and engineered whole life policies affected by the economy, inflation, interest rates, et cetera? And are they private or in, private and independent, which we already covered, but I think we'll wrap on that and uh, whoever wants to take it. I feel like somebody else got to take it. I've been talking. Yeah, I, I feel. Caleb, you want to hit on that one? I mean, yeah. I let me. Long, can you read? Can you reread read that to me? Can you sure, sure. Reread. So our our IBC policies, specially designed whole life policies, affected by the economy, inflation, or interest rates. Yeah. So the answer is yes. <laughs> um, inflation is is just a function of interest rates, essentially. So let's clump them all together and we say affected sometimes we go to the negative like something's affected by by something that that's bad well right now we're going to see our life insurance policies whole life insurance policies pay more <laughs> why because of interest rates going up so yeah the interest rates are affecting whole life insurance in a good way and vice versa when interest rates were all time low um whole life was not earning and paying out what people were getting in the 80s. It's all a function. It's all a function of where things are at. And and when I think of it, it it's it's one of the most safe, 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 safe foundational places that you can store your money where I would rather have my money in whole life insurance than any other bank out there. So it's just like the same question. Is a savings account affected by interest rates? Yes. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, it, but that's it does. And, and it brings me to a, a unique conversation I had with Sandra, who's our application specialist. And uh, we we're talking about a client the other day that she literally had to dismiss. Uh, and the client, probably an engineer, was just saying, you know, I, I've run spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet. And this doesn't make any sense. And I can put my money in a high yield savings account and do better in a high yield savings than I can in the whole life. Now, Right there, the first thing that person doesn't understand is that a bank is a function of the Fed's interest rate and monetary policy. When the Fed drops rates, that bank account goes down. Your whole life has a contractual guaranteed interest rate, which never changes until the day you die when it pays out. There's there's massive differences in, in you know, if you're always just looking in the rear view mirror, thinking everything's great at this present point, you are not seeing the real value. So I think you nailed it. And I think right now, the one thing that a lot of people need to understand is the noisier and messier and uglier it gets out there, Wall Street will just call that, the calmer and more collected and the better it gets in here. Because when that all goes to turmoil, all that money needs to go somewhere. And guess where it's going to come? It's going to come over here. So a lot of people, we opened this conversation with, why would I bring competitors on? Because they're not competitors these are the leaders in this industry. These are the creators in this industry. These are the people that are going to pave the way for millions, millions of people that need guidance, need proper advice on what to do with their money, because everything's about to fall apart out there and it's about to get really good in here. So that is what I call the ultimate creation. Now, anyone else want to hit on that about the economy, inflation or interest rates? I, right. I don't know. I mean, I, I would just say that Chris, you can't help yourself. I can't, you, you're yeah, good, you're I mean, good this, topic, this topic, I love that. Like, this is one. Like, I could literally <laughs> rap on this topic for an hour. Like, this is my favorite thing about like the history of the economic cycles. And 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 listen, whole life insurance follows chases the Fed rate. It just does. It chases interest rates, right? So, you know, we've we've come through this phase, and I do a lot of talks on this where. You know, from 1980 when I was born, um, so I'm dating myself a little bit, but from 1980 when I was born through 2009, we lived in this decreasing interest rate environment. And so as interest rates went down, the there was this crossover point where dividend rates became higher than interest rates, right? So you could actually, that's where this like whole positive arbitrage conversation started. Well, moving forward, interest rates are going up. So what we do for financial success in an increasing interest rate environment is not the same as what you do to create wealth in a decreasing interest rate environment. Now, there are certain principles that are never going to change, but different strategies, um, you know, uh, exist in different environments. And, you know, as we move forward, as interest rates go up, uh, dividend rates will chase, but there's always a lag, you know, and it's, it's important to understand 
as inflation goes up, interest rates are going to go up because of the nature of if inflation is high, the Fed is going to increase interest rates to get inflation under control. And like Chris said, if you're if you if if you're thinking about high yield savings accounts to be the solution to your problem and you think it's better than whole life, that means you're you're thinking too short term. You're not thinking long term. I always kind of tell people you don't solve long term problems with short term thinking. You know, and and high yield savings accounts is absolutely a short term thinking mindset. And so um, I I would just that's the the thing about this stuff is you have to understand that the whole life policy is just it, it's 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 part of a bigger ecosystem you know and and there's so many more variables that kind of come into play um you just got to you just got to understand the game it's all a game and you got to understand the moving parts uh, on the chessboard and um and it's different Caleb talked about it earlier the value of control is different for everybody you know um the the value of control for some people is actually a negative value um, because you haven't become who you need to be yet. And having access to capital and having that control of money uh, before you're ready for it uh, can create more problems. I mean, we've all talked to plenty of people that make a lot of money that are wildly in debt and just up to their eyeballs and problems, right? Because they they didn't have their money uh, in, in alignment with their values and their beliefs and, and all these different things, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I would say... Just, just, just know, like the market is cyclical. It's always going to go through these cycles. It's totally normal, um, and and make sure that you don't get caught up in these traps about you know these short term things. You got to think long term. That's that's what I would say. Hundred percent. Well, I know we went way over, folks, but it was worth it, right? You all enjoyed that. I mean, we had to we had to take that one into overtime. So one of the things I want to do real quick is I want to give you all opportunities to go on and. Just go to these legendary YouTube channels for Chris and for Caleb and for Devin and absorb their material. I know you're all watching my channel, but also watch their channels. We're saying the same thing, sometimes in different ways, but that's good. There's no one right, there's no one perfect way to do this. We are creating all sorts of new ways to do this. So please learn from them. Caleb, how would they find you on YouTube and social media? Yeah, thank you for posting it a few times, but it's just better wealth. And we also have a channel called The And Asset. And it would mean the world if you could subscribe and comment and like. And then also, if you have read my book, The And Asset, and you could take two minutes out of your day and create a, a five-star review on Amazon, that really helps increase more credibility in the book market and helps more people get the book. So those are those are the two things. And it's an absolute honor. And like I said, we're going to be intentional about having conversations with with people. And so if you have questions and want to do part two, like we'll probably be hosting more of these on our channel and we want to hear exactly from you. So thank you, Chris, for making this happen. Oh, you're very welcome. Devin's holding up your books. So Devin, let me just come over to you. How do people find you? Well, first off, guys, if you have not read this book, read it. I don't have one. It was so good. I got two. Um, I actually have the book. It was the second book I read when I learned about infinite banking back in 2020. And then come like two years later, I get a voice message from Caleb while I'm in my pool in my backyard. Craziest thing ever. He's like, Hey, this is Caleb Williams. Um, love what you're doing in the, the space. Would love to have you speak at my event. And I'm like, I thought I was in the twilight zone. I'm like, I learned about this concept. I read this guy's book. And now he's messaging me. And at the end, Caleb, if you remember, he's like, he's like, all right, man, love you. And, and then he stops. He's like, that's probably weird because you don't know me, but I just love people. So. <laughs> but um, get this book. It's incredible. Um, I read through it really quickly and I'm a horrible reader. So great, great book. Um, you guys can check out my stuff on Mr. Underscore Burr. So B with four R's like you see back there. And that's my YouTube channel. That's my Instagram, my TikTok. And yeah, the YouTube I'm trying to grow, it is very difficult as Chris knows, as um, everyone on the panel knows, it's a very difficult thing to grow. But Instagram, if you guys aren't following me there, also check that out. I appreciate you. Love it. Chris, real, real quick, real quick. How do people find you, man? Yeah, just just real quick. Devin, I love you, man. Thank you for sharing that. 
if there's advisors watching this, Chris, thanks to Chris Noggle, he just posted, we're having our third annual and asset mastermind. And if you're an advisor, this is only for financial advisors, people in our space, people that work with clients. Um, you can go there. It will sell out. We're going to have 150 people. I believe every single person on this call will be in that room and it would be an honor to have you there. So thanks to Chris, you just posted it, but I just wanted to give context. That was when Devin and I first met and my hope is to see you all there. All right, Chris. It, uh, it cut out on me again. So, um, yeah, um, life 180 YouTube channel is the best way to get a hold of me. It's where I am. Um, if you, uh, if you want to uh, check out the the Instagram channel, that's where I'm doing a lot of my stuff down here. It's kind of more behind the scenes. I do some short reels and stuff, but it's real Chris Kirkpatrick. So it's just at real Chris Kirkpatrick, my name. Um, and then I realized, uh, Stephen, thank you for sharing the cash flow hacking link. I realized I did that. I gave you the wrong link. <laughs> so um, I gave you the link for my fund. The cashflowhacking.com is actually the fund link. Cashflowhackingbook.com is is anybody who wants a free copy of the book. You can get it for Amazon for 20 bucks or you can get it there. It's it's free. And uh anybody that that you know doesn't even want to pay for it, I'm happy to send a, a digital copy as well. Anybody can just email me chris at life180.com and I'll send you a, a a digital copy of the book as well. Fantastic. And Mr. Snaggy. All right, man. You can find me exclusively right here every Wednesday, 1 p.m. And uh, also on Private Money Club. Go to privatemoneyclub.com. Join the community. We are a community of private money lenders and real estate investors. And it's where the magic happens. So if you're looking to uh, find money, to find deals, it's the dating site for money. So we'll see you there, privatemoneyclub.com. All right. Well, with that being said, Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you, over 160 of you who joined us today for this epic, but not last, wealth webinar where we bring the leaders, the creators in this industry together for you and solely for you. We will be doing more of this and folks, I just all, I, I'll never be able to tell you in words how much I appreciate your, your undivided attention and support. Uh, we will keep creating, we will keep giving and we will keep pushing this forward so that you all can take back control of your money by being the bank. We won't stop. Not now, not never. We'll see you on the next wealth webinar next week or this afternoon at ask me anything. Thanks everybody. See you next time. All right. All right. <laughs> thanks so much guys. This is awesome. Thanks for yeah. Coming. Thanks for sticking in there. I know we went a little over. Appreciate that. No, it's good. I, I love this stuff. So it's awesome. Guys, Chris, sure. you got to come on What the F uh, with us soon. Yeah, you know? for sure. We got to talk economics over there, man. We had Let's a good do one. It. You tell me when. I'll be there. Yeah, that's always that. a fun one. That's like my favorite topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a lot yeah. of crazy stuff happening too right now. You guys, so. you guys ever want to do an event down here, you let me know. We're putting together a retreat center and uh, like- it's, oh, That's Shauna's that's Shauna's can, neck of the woods all day long. So we, we, can host, we can host events for up to uh, 25 people right now. So it's not huge, but by the end of the year, we'll be able to take up to 55 to 60 people. Yeah, we'd probably have to wait till 55 with staff for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have other- other hotels that are right next door too. We could put people up if we hosted enough, but it's, it's pretty cool. Awesome. Good. Do it. But, yeah. And right. then uh, I'm trying to think uh, one other thing to Caleb with your event. Can you shoot uh, an email over to yep. either Shauna or Rachel? Shauna I, Shauna's Shana. amazing. I, every time okay, I see yeah, you, Shauna comment, Shana. I'm like, how in the world did Chris get someone like you? So I'm giving you a hard time, but like, that's, you're incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you're incredible. Snowboarding like, man. Snowboarding. He That's answers. Awesome. I email right back. You've been on the board. She's been like in the comments. Unbelievable. So shout out to you. I'll get you details because it'd be amazing to have you speak, be in the room. And like, I just want to curate 150 incredible humans. Um, Garrett Gunderson's going to be there. There's going to be some really great people that like want to go deeper. And so, um, yeah, I'll get you guys more details for sure. Love it, man. All right. Well, this was an epic one. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And you guys, enjoy your day. Right. Thanks, guys. Hey, bye. Take care, guys. Thank you. See you, Chris.